Uh, we've gone through one, two, three, four, and we get five, and we are on six. Uh, this is a, a prayer. And how many of you, I'm going to start this off this way, how many of you have uh, been in a tough spot? You can remember back in your life where it was a dark time. I mean, everything looked like it was falling apart. Uh, you can, it looked like you had enemies on all sides. Even some of maybe your closest friends had betrayed you. Uh, your health was falling apart. Uh, maybe a combination of all those. Maybe a part of those. Uh, David's in a place here where it's all of those. <laughs> He's like, I've, I've got them all. I've got enemies. I've, my health is falling apart. Uh, he's experiencing emotional depression, uh, serious emotional depression, as you're going to talk about here, to the point where he says, I uh, made my bed to swim. And you can tell the visual imagery that he's portraying across here. He's doing a lot of crime, okay? And uh, we're going to go through this, and, and David gives us an example of how to pray. So this isn't just about David, although these are David's problems. But he puts them in such a way that we can relate to them. We, we've been to this place, and we're thinking back a few different times in my life, the darkest hours or whatever. Uh, there's been a couple of different times where I've not felt maybe quite to this extent, but I've certainly felt some of these things. And uh, oh, man, there's no way out of this. There's no hope. There's enemy on every side. My health is failing. Whatever it is that we feel like it, we're struggling with. And uh, yeah. God is there. God answers prayer. God will sustain us through. He may not always work it out the way we figure it's supposed to work out. But he will always do something, and he is faithful to the people who trust in him. And, and we get this example from David of how to pray. Because how many of you, going back to my first question, how many of you have been a difficult time, and you didn't know what to say? You didn't know what to, you, you, you knew you needed to pray, you knew you needed to seek God, but you didn't know where to begin. You didn't know how to begin. You didn't know what to say, what to do. And, and David gives us kind of an outline, if you will, uh, uh, what to go through, what to say, what to plead for. And I want to start off with one very important thing. If you fall asleep now and you miss the rest of the sermon, which is fine, that's okay, you probably need your rest. If you get one thing from this message, that is that God does care. God cares more about your little problems, or what you think are little problems, than probably you care about those problems. Think about it. I mean, God says in His Word, He says, if one sparrow falls... I see that, and I care about it, and I know that that happens. Now, how many of you, a uh, sparrow probably fell yesterday, you didn't even notice. You weren't there. You didn't necessarily care. You, weren't, you didn't see it happen. But God cares to that kind of detail. And Jesus even makes the point. He says, hey, how much in your culture does it cost? Two farthings, which is worth literally pennies uh, in today's money that a sparrow is worth. And Jesus says, hey, it's of infinite value to me. So you are of infinite value to God. And God cares about you infinitely. Each and every one of your, your little problems that you deal with, or big problems, whatever they are, it does not matter. God cares for them, and God wants you to bring them to, to, bring them to Him, and He wants to hear them, and He wants to listen to them. And this is what David is trying to tell you through this song. He's trying to remind you that it doesn't matter what you're struggling with, health, uh, is whatever issue, your depression, whatever you're struggling with, God cares. He wants you to lay them, on, as it says in Hebrews, on the throne of grace, and allow Him to work a miracle for you of change. Change. How many of you are in a tough spot and you want to change? I mean, how many? Okay, we'll back this up a little bit. How many of you in a tough spot and you didn't want change? You're like, oh, I'm just perfectly ready to accept that my emotions are falling apart, that I'm in depression, and that I see no way out of this, that I have no hope. I'm good. That's okay. I'm great. You know, if you're in that state, you're probably not going to get help. But God wants change. He wants to help you, and He can help you. And if you call out to Him, He will hear your prayer, and He will deliver you from the things that oppress you the most. Because that's what God is. He's here to give us freedom, not just from sin, but from the things that we struggle with, from all the things that, God, that we struggle with. God wants to give us freedom from those things. Cry out to Him. You remember the, the, the Israelites in Egypt? That was the first thing they did. Well, not the first thing they did, but eventually they got to the point where it got so tough. They said, hey, we got to get on our knees and start crying out. And God said, I heard that prayer, and I prepared a way of deliverance. And God did. And like I said, it might not be the way you think it should be, but there will be a way of deliverance. So this, this is essentially a list of things that we should pray for, that we should beg for from God. Plead and beg for Him and say, God, I need this. I need it all the time. And this is a, should be a continual prayer of your heart. 
And some people say, oh, I struggle to pray. I struggle to have this time to pray. And, uh, you know, I struggle to have the desire to pray. Well, <laughs> if you understand where God is and how much He cares for you, praying should come by second nature. You should just, wow, yeah, I'm in the car by myself. Boom, I'm going to start praying, calling out to God. God, deliver me in this situation. God, please protect my family. Lord, uh, deliver our community from the, the attacks of Satan. Whatever it is, just keep praying. Prayer should come naturally when you believe that God cares for you and the problems and issues that you struggle with. So what are some things that David shows us by his example what we should be praying for? We've got a couple of things. Let's just make sure this is working here. There we go. Start slow. There we go. Okay, we're good. All right, the first one here is, and this is, of course, in your notes. You'll notice that in your bulletin, you have a copy of the Scripture passage, and then you have a list of notes there that you can follow along. And then the verses that are there highlighted will be up on the screen. But the first thing we should do is to beg for mercy. This is, uh, this is absolutely essential. But let's look at these, uh, verse 1 here. Uh, we'll notice here that this is the chief musician on Neg uh, know, he was terrible, but Negoth, Neganoth, uh, which is like, uh, if I remember correctly, that's more wind instruments, flutes, lutes, those type of things. Upon Sheminath, a psalm of David. So David specifies uh, who's supposed to be directed to, that, that it is written by him. And that it's supposed to be played by the chief musician, and he even, like we've talked about in the past, specifies exactly what type of instruments it's supposed to be played on. But here we have the first one that says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. That's the first thing we should always start our prayer with. Because let's face it, let's face the reality all of us have sinned, all of us deserve hell, none of us deserve deliverance. Uh, if you are in your sin and you're unrepentant before God, you uh, have His wrath upon you. He's a holy, righteous, just God who will destroy all sin eventually. Any deviancy from His law and from His, His divine command will be punished. That's a righteous judge. You can imagine uh, a judge that says, well, you know, this guy lied. I don't care if he committed murder. I'm just going to let him go free. Is that a good judge? No. That's a bad judge. And God is certainly not a bad judge. He's a righteous, holy God that expects uh, absolute perfection. And the reality is, is none of us have it. None of us. I don't care how good you think you are this morning. You are nowhere close to being good enough to uh, have God's mercy. Mercy is undeserved. That's the definition of what mercy is. It's giving someone favor when they do not deserve it. I'm sure you've probably heard the story of Napoleon when when the older lady that came to beg for her son's life, her son had deserted, they were going to shoot him the next morning. She said, hey, could you please spare my son's life and give him mercy? And Napoleon said, no, he doesn't deserve it. He deserted in battle. He left his men to die. And therefore, he deserves the punishment of death. It's what is ordered and should be ordained. And she said, no, could you please give my son mercy? And Napoleon said, no, wait, you didn't understand. I just explained to you he does not deserve mercy. She didn't give up. She asked one more time. Could you please give my son mercy? And it finally dawned on Napoleon what she was really asking for. Mercy is not deserved. See, we're the ones that deserve the punishment. We deserve eternal hell. But God, is in His mercy, if we are willing to beg for it, is always there to give it to us. If we go to Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and following, we see very clearly that it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, like, sometimes I like to figure out if there's a way that I can get myself in the exception to all, but there isn't. All of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. None of us have followed His law by perfection. In fact, some of us, I mean, let's admit it, me included, we've made some major boo-boos. We've done some serious crimes. And God is willing to forgive everything if we call upon Him. And that's what the verse continues, being justified or declared innocent, made holy, but how did that come about? Freely, not by your earning it, or you thinking that you, well, I'm going to say thanks a lot of prayers, or do such and such, and then God or God's favor. No, it comes freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, very specifically, but it continues, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. When was the last time you used that little bit of a long word? Trust me, it wasn't any time recently, but that simply means payment. You deserve punishment, and Jesus stepped into that place for you and took that punishment for you 
And, and he paid the price through faith in his blood, his death on the cross, to declare his righteousness for the remission. Again, big long word meaning payment for our sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. While God is a righteous, holy judge who will destroy all sin in his path, he also loves us and wants to give us mercy. And that's why he sends his son to give us forgiveness. So David, back to David's prayer here, he says, it, he says it just like he should say it. A man who's probably committed murder and adultery and everything else you could probably commit, every law that he has broken of God. He says, Lord, rebuke, rebuke me not in thine anger, chasten me in thy hot displeasure. That word chasten, I know that sounds really kind of King Jamesy and all kind of complicated, but it's really a very simple concept. Uh, it, uh, it really means to spank you. That's what he's saying. He says, God, please don't spank me. I deserve it. Don't, but please don't give me the punishment that I deserve. This is the situation all of us are in. All of us should pray this prayer. I don't care what prayer you pray. Yeah, this should be your prayer. God, forgive me my sin. And I know I deserve a punishment, but I throw myself upon the mercy of your son and the payment that he has already made for my sin. And I'm declared innocent through his blood. See, the, we all, everybody's asking this question, pastors especially, or one wondering, how come Christians don't act like Christians? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I'll tell you, there's one simple answer. Christians don't act like Christians because they don't believe they're Christians. And let me break that down a little bit more. Christians don't act like Christians because they don't believe they're Christians. They might believe, yes, I believe in the, in the name of Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross. But they don't really truly believe that they are justified or declared innocent by his blood. See, until you realize the new identity that you're given by the power of Jesus Christ, you will never live in that power and grace that he freely gives you. So the first thing that we should start every prayer off with is beg for mercy. And you're going to catch a running thing here because it's all good. We, we should beg. We should beg. And that's really what he's doing. He's, he's just throwing himself upon the mercy of God. He says, oh, Lord, rebuke me not in thy anger, neither chasten me in my hot displeasure. Even with some of the older words in here in this passage, you can gain a, a very visual understanding of how God is angry at sin and wants to punish it. Punish it. But David wants to be spared that punishment through, by the mercy of God. And God does have mercy. Let's look at the next one, verse, verse 2 here. It says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. And again, that uh, kind of sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. They're, they're actually tremble uh, is, is the word, the Hebrew word there. That they, they move uh, kind of involuntarily. Uh, and uh, the, the word for weak is not just simply morally weak, although uh, David could talk about that, but he's actually talking about, more specifically here, the fact that he is physically weak, that he is struggling with certain physical ailments uh, that he is dealing with. How many of you have been in that situation? I don't know, where's my hand? I've through some illnesses. Some of you have been through some serious illnesses, way more serious than I've ever encountered. But we need to call out for mercy from God and beg for physical healing. This is what we do during prayer time. That's why we have that new prayer request board back there. We're going to be having a Wednesday night prayer time because we need to be lifting each other up in prayer and ourselves and ask for physical healing. It seems like what uh, he's describing here, that his bones are vexed or that they tremble continually, is some kind of fever. I don't know what David specifically struggled with, but it's some kind of severe fever that probably came back often. In my mind, that sounds like malaria. You could go do some study, figure out what it is, and come back and tell me. But whatever it was, it was continuous, and it was very severe. And David's like, God, please heal me. Lord, I need physical healing. My body is broken. It's falling apart, and, and I need God's healing in my life. Now, remember, sometimes God does grant healing. Sometimes he doesn't, all according to his mercy and his plan. But we should be asking and pleading God. This is exactly what David is doing. He's saying, God, I have physical ailments. Come and heal those physical ailments. And he's trusting that God will deliver him. So the first thing that we should do is beg for mercy. The second thing that we should do is beg for uh, physical healing. But there's some more that we need to beg for. The third thing is that we should beg for spiritual healing. Now, you will notice that here, verse 1 it is my first one. Verse 2 is the second point. But if you look at your notes there, you'll notice that there are verses 3 through 5 dealing with this next thing, spiritual healing. Because we all need it. Now, I'm going to uh, let you in on a secret here. You can't do it. 
I know we have tons and tons of self-help, motivation, blah, 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 stuff out there that's even gotten in the church. And we're trying to do pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And if I just do this, I'm going to make it. And I'm going to, you know, it's, I'm going to make this happen. But you cannot heal yourself. Got to go back and listen to some of my sermons on Romans. We went into great detail on that, right? Uh, in extensive detail. You cannot heal yourself. That's what the Roman believers thought. They believe in justification by faith alone. They believe in, in all those things that we would, we would believe in as well. What they didn't believe is that God could change them. It was about sanctification. They thought, hey, if we just follow the law of God, we just cling to it, and, and we just do our very best, we're going to become a better person. But is that true? No, Paul says, no, wait, whoa, 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 slow down. That's only going to produce more sin and more death, more spiritual de depravity, more spiritual sickness. He said the only way you can change is by calling out to God and allowing God's grace to come into your life and change you by His power completely. This is what David does. Even though he is living before Christ, even died on the cross, he's looking forward to Christ's power and he's saying, God, heal me. I've got major spiritual problems. And if you don't believe me, go read some of the stories about David. He had some major spiritual problems. He had some major spiritual struggles. Let's break this down what, what, as, as to what he's asking for here. A couple of things that we're going to see here. First of all, verse 3. Let's look at that one first. We see here that uh, his, his call for spiritual healing is immediate. Let's, let's look at verse 3. My soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Now, can you imagine if uh, you were in great emotional distress and you were in a major uh, emotional, spiritual trouble, and God said, you know, I'm, I'm in the restroom right now. I'll be there in a few minutes. Is that very encouraging? I've even been in a really tough spot. And he said, well, you know, you know, somebody that was supposed to help you was like, oh, just a sec, I'll deal with it in just a minute. I'm busy right now. Does God do that? No, God is right there. And he, he implies this by his question. He says, how long, O Lord? While he feels like uh, just a few seconds would, would be way too long, he also is acknowledging that God is going to be there, that God is going to be there immediately. And that he cares not at the moment that David utters those words, not just sometime in the future. Spiritual healing comes now. Go back to study in the New Testament. Paul is very clear about that in Romans. He says, hey, if you don't believe that spiritual healing comes past tense and is present continuous, you're going to miss the point of the gospel. That's what the, that's what the early Christians were struggling with. Spiritual healing can come now. It comes simply with surrender. It comes simply with us saying, I can't do it. God, come into my life and change my life and come take over your, uh, your power. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in the time, uh, the time accepted, in the day of salvation I have suffered thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. See, the problem with a lot of believers today, we worry about the past. Maybe you worry about, well, I don't know. It's a major mistakes back there. Or maybe, maybe you're younger, or you're new in your faith, and you're looking forward, and you're like, well, how, how am I going to keep in this? I, you know, I, I feel the power of God now. I, I have a yearning for God's Word now, but, but, but I look at the future, and I look at all the temptation, and all the things, that, and then I look and see all my, some of my friends who are in the faith, and then they walked away, and they disappeared, and I worry. Is God going to preserve me in the future? See, God doesn't ask for you to worry about the past. God doesn't ask for you to worry about the future. God just says, trust me right now, and I'll take care of both. That's what he's saying right here in this verse. He says, now is the time of acceptance. We don't have to worry about the past. I've heard many people say, well, God couldn't save me. I've done too much evil. That's not true. And we don't have to worry about the future. Well, God, God couldn't save me because I'm just a person that, that fails all the time. And whenever I get temptation, I just fall right into it. No, we don't have to worry about that. What you need to do is say, I'm going to make a choice right now and trust that God has saved me, cleansed me by His blood, justified me past tense continuous, and that I can rest in His power and He will deliver me. He, uh, David is calling for deliverance, spiritual deliverance, and that is immediate. But that's not it. Let's keep going. Verse 4 is also complete. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. Now, can you imagine if you were in, in this kind of situation, Paul, David is talking about uh, that he's got physical enemies, he's got spiritual enemies, he's got all kinds of problems. Can you imagine if God said, okay, I'm going to get you out of the physical issues, 
but I'm not going to deliver you spiritually. That would be terrible. That would be tragic. Uh, because actually, the way God usually works in, in our lives is that it's the other way around. Because the other is more important. See, God may not deliver you out of a physically difficult situation because He wants to work on you spiritually and to change your perspective. Yeah. How many of you have been in that place? I've certainly been there. I'm like, God, you know, if I could just be out of this situation, I'd be happy. And God's like, no, I'm using this situation to make you happy. <laughs> so you're going to stay there. Because I want to teach you a lesson through this situation. You remember uh, Paul calls out to, to, to God and says, Deliver me from this messenger, this thorn in the flesh. Yeah. He prays three times and God says, No, it's not going away because Paul, you got a pride issue. And this is how I'm going to deal with it in your life. So God's spiritual healing is complete. It goes down to our very soul. That eternal being that is within us, that is immortal. And we'll end up in one or two places, right? Hell or heaven. And he says, that's where I want to deliver you. That's where I want to give you not just partial deliverance, but complete deliverance. Let's look at Psalm 79, verse 8. It says, oh, remember not, not against us our former iniquities. See, David knows. Man, I've got some major things I did wrong. He was a murderer, an adulterer. He did it all. He says, God, please forgive me of those things. Don't remember those things. Let thy tender mercy speedily uh, prevent us, for we were brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. That's what I said earlier. Christians don't act like Christians because they don't believe they're Christians. You don't believe that you're saved. You don't believe that you're changed. You don't believe that your, your sins are washed away out of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that you can walk in spiritual victory and not in sin anymore. God does not remember your, your sins anymore. We see also here that first of all that it's immediate, it's complete, but deliverance is also enduring. You imagine if you were in a difficult situation and someone saved you out of it and then they put you right back into it. What kind of a savior would that be? You imagine if you're drowning out here in the ocean and they, they pull you out, dry you off, and you know, Oh, wow, I'm so glad to not be drowning anymore. And then they shove you right back in. No, that's not what God does. God's deliverance is enduring. It continues on. Let's look at verse 5. Uh, and for in death there is no remembrance of thee. And grave the grave, who shall give thee thanks? What he's talking about is that in eternity, those that go into eternity lost, uh, un un resisting the power of God into hell, He's saying, they're not going to be able to thank you. But I can thank you because I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to be there for all the rest of eternity, praising God and His deliverance. We've got a couple of verses here. Let's go on to the next one here. Psalm 86, verse 13. It says, For great is thy mercy toward me, for thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Now, again, this is what I'm going to go back to. Uh, the situation here, David's in a tough spot. Uh, I think this is continuing on what we've talked about in the past. You remember he's fled out into the desert. His own son has betrayed him and is now chasing him and trying to kill him. And that situation doesn't go away overnight. In fact, there's, David deals with the ramifications of that situation to the very end of his life. So you might say, well, David, I mean, come on. This, did God really deliver you? I mean, you still struggled with some of these issues for the rest of your life. Even though Absalom was killed, there were still other consequences that David had to do, deal with the betrayal of a close friend that actually killed his own son, so on and so forth. Go back and read the story. It, it, there's a lot of detail there. But if we believe that God is just simply going to de deliver you here on this earth, that he doesn't care about your spiritual destiny, then it's a very weak and very passive God that we worship. But God does not just care about the immediate. He cares about, more importantly, the eternal destiny of where you're going. And He wants to deliver you from the lowest hell. All the, the, the destruction of what has existed. We have a very clear description of Revelation 20. I think we're going to have to kind of move through this kind of quickly. But I would encourage you to go back and read it. We have a very vivid description of what hell is about. It's a terrible place. And God cares more importantly. He would rather you go through some difficulty here on this earth to spare you from eternal hell than the other way around. And you need to remember that. You know, if the early Christians believed, well, you know, uh, you know, that's just a side thing, they wouldn't have gone out there and faced the lions. They wouldn't have gone out there and been led and burned on the crosses that they were killed on. 
So we see a few things here. Let's go back and review. We see that we should beg for God's mercy, first and primarily, every day. God, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me through the blood of your Son. Cleanse me from the, from the sins that I have committed. Beg for mercy. We see also that we should beg for physical healing. We see thirdly that we should beg for spiritual healing. But also, what about emotional healing? Can you imagine if God said, well, I'll fix your spiritual problems, I'll fix your physical problems, but your emotional ones, that's okay. You know, you can just struggle with those all your life. Don't worry about that stuff. No, God wants to heal those too. Let's look at verses 6 and 7 here. David gives us, a, like I said, a very vivid description of what's going on in his life. My eye is consumed with grief. Of course, he's using a verbal language to show that he is weeping continually. He's in great distress. Remember, who was David? Was he some kind of emotionally weak guy that couldn't handle any problems? No, he was a warrior. I mean, there was no one more brave than who David was. But here he's a man, a warrior, broken, just pleading out with God, weeping every day. His heart is broken. But he continues on with his visual image. He says, the night I make my bed to swim. Again, it literally, not, it's not his bed swimming in a pool, pool of tears. But you can imagine that what he's trying to express here. I weep all night long to the point that I wake up the next morning and my pillow is, is soaked with tears. Does God care about that? But he doesn't stop there. He uses three different visual images to try to portray what he's going through. He says, I walk, I water my couch with my tears. How many of you have been in this kind of situation? How many of you have been in those dark days? You wept. And I've been there. I've prayed and cried and wondered where God was, was and wept for God and fasted for days on end, pleading for God to change the situation I was in. And God can. He does care about the emotional problems that we go through, the trials that sustain, that we, that we struggle with. And He can give us emotional healing through the power of His Word. It continues there, verse 7. It says, My eye is consumed with grief. It waxes old because of my enemies. He says, I weep so much. It feels like my body is breaking down because of how much, how much emotional pain I'm going through. But think about how much emotional pain would you be in if the son that you loved betrayed you and was after you to kill you? That's a pretty terrible situation. I hope you've never experienced that. I've never experienced that. But he's saying, hey, this is my, I'm in a terrible situation. I weep. And you have to think about it too. I mean, uh, all of what was happening in David's life, he had kind of caused. He had started it all off with him committing adultery and then murder to try to cover up his adultery. And then now he was experiencing a lot of the pain and suffering that was directly from what he had done wrong. So, okay, well, that kind of guy. Now, now a spiritual person who is perfect, God will take care of their emotional problems. But a guy like David, who, I mean, he brought it on himself. Will God take care of his emotional problems? Yeah, that's what David was trying to say. He says, man, I deserve every single bit of this. But God is still willing to heal my emotional problems. My emotional struggles, my tears. We have a beautiful illustration here in Psalm 126. I just love this passage. I've been many times in my life I've meditated on this passage and it's given me encouragement, strength to continue on. It says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like in the dream. See, that's what Jesus is all about. Remember, it, remember his mission statement there in Luke chapter 4? Jesus says, I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. A, a bruised reed and a broken, I'm not going to break those. I'm, gonna, I'm here to repair, to set people free from captivity. Go back and read that. Luke, I think it's Luke 11, 4. But God wants to set you free from the, cap, the prison of depression, from the prison of, of grief, from the prison of pain, from the prison of physical pain. God wants to set you free and again deliver you from those things. When the Lord turned again, the uh, captivity of Zion, we're like dead in the dream. What the psalmist is saying is here, when God delivered us from the trials that we were in, we didn't even believe it was happening. We thought we were dreaming because it was too wonderful. God can answer your prayer in that way. And He will. Maybe not, like I said, in the way you think it should be, but He will. But it continues, and it's, it's just as it's just more beautiful as it goes on. It says, Our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. How many of you can remember times about that was not the case for you? Hey, you had anything but that. But God can be that. And then they said on the heathen, that's the people who are your enemies. They went into your life and they said, wow, God's working there. Have you ever had that experience? 
Somebody looked into your life, and you told them your life story, and you told them the things that you went through, and they said, wow, we can see the hand of God. They don't even believe in God, but they, they can see the hand of God in your life. That's what the psalmist is describing here. But he continues, the Lord had done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The psalmist continues, that as we weep, we, he, we brings back uh, us, uh, that harvest, that harvest of tears, and he brings something out of it, glorious, rebuilds it. Do you remember in Romans 8.28 it says, God works all things together for good for them that love him. For them that call according to his purpose. Are you that this morning? Then all things are going to work together. Even the most tragic, terrible, terrifying things that you have been through, God is going to eventually turn those around. And you're going to be able to look back and say, wow, look what God has done through all that pain and through all that suffering. The amazing healing in God. So God, let's reveal here. God wants you to, you to beg for mercy. God wants you to beg for physical healing. God wants you to beg for spiritual healing. But He also wants you to beg for emotional healing. And finally this morning, He wants you to beg for deliverance. you believe that God can deliver you? He will. He can. Even in the toughest of situations. Let's look at David's situation here. He describes it verses 8 through 10. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard my voice of weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will deliver my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and sore backs. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Now remember, some of these enemies, they have deserved it. <laughs> remember, he had some enemies. Like, I think it's, it's an ab not Abner, but the, the father of that Sheila. I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head. Uh, he joined Absalom against David. Absolutely, being the son of David. And the reason why was because David had uh, committed adultery with his daughter, granddaughter, excuse me, not his daughter, his granddaughter, and then murdered his, her, her husband. Now, is that the kind of guy you want to spend time with? Probably not. All right, I didn't think he wouldn't like him either. Uh, so some of this he deserved, his enemies. And he's saying, God's going to deliver me, even though I deserve the punishment that came upon me. Like when Shimei came out and cursed him, they said, let's go, go ahead and do it. I deserve it. But God can deliver and turn that around. And God did. If you remember, if you read the whole story, eventually David was restored to the throne. God worked through it. Yeah, it wasn't all probably the way David had preferred it or wanted it, but God worked through the situation. But more importantly, like we started off with, God wants to deliver you from eternal, your eternal destiny. God wants to deliver you from the, the spiritual warfare that you are in, which is so much more important than uh, whatever physical things that we observe around us. But I put this in your notes because I want you to remember this. God loves to hear the cry of the oppressor. Now, how do you know that? Am I on the side of God? That's been the eternal question throughout history. Um, are we on the side of God? Are God's on our side? So on and so forth. But I can tell you what. If you're oppressing somebody else, God is not on your side. God will not help you. In fact, God will do his utmost to stop you. You're going to be in trouble. God loves to hear the cry of the oppressed. If you go back and look through the Old Testament, we can see over and over again, like I said earlier, the, the Israelites, they're, they're being oppressed in slavery. Uh, the, the, the king orders, hey, I want all the, the, the males born to be killed. And then, of course, the midwives say, well, hey, we're not going to do that, so we're, we're just going to disobey, and we're going to deliver these boys anyways. And, and just continues on and on. And then they, do, they are eventually delivered from Egypt. God hears their cries. And that, all of that is recorded it's to tell you one thing. That God will hear your cry. Like I said, it may not be in ways you think that it should be. But God will deliver you. God is in the business of deliverance. The very gospel message is about deliverance. God loves to hear the cry of the oppressed and will give them the truth for their deliverance. We're going to get to the psalm eventually. But this, I've been studying Psalm 12 and it just, just blown me away what this psalm is saying here in Psalm chapter 12. Uh, and it's just become a life verse for me. The oppression of the poor. If you go back and read the whole psalm, there's some very important verses before this, but we can kind of get what's going on here by reading these verses. The oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puppeth at him. See, God wants to deliver you from the ultimate oppressor. Who's that? Satan. You know, he wants your soul in hell. He wants to destroy you. You're in the image of God. He hates you. 
But God can deliver you even from him, much less any other oppressors that are in your life. Uh, whether Even if it's spiritual oppressors, like this group, depression, anxiety, fear, all those things that oppress us. You know, I was, I was read that verse 5, I was like, wow, God wants to deliver me. But I never put it together with verses 6 through 7. The next verses. How does God want to deliver you? See, God is in the business of setting people free, from, especially the tyranny of sin. And how does he do it? Well, there's one simple answer. It's right here. This book, the Bible, God's Word. You know, there's been many times in my past, in my past like all those times that I mentioned earlier, I won't go into all the details, we don't have time. But <clears throat> where I was crying out to God, God speak to me, God, I want your deliverance, I need your help. And I was crying out, looking at all these different places, and right there on my shelf was the answer that God gave me. Right there. See, this is it. God's word is what is he, is how he is how God says, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna do something about this. And see, we think, oh, wow, God's just going to come in here and you know, do something crazy or wipe everybody out or something. No, what does he promise to do? It's in there right there in verse 6. This is God's deliverance. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forevermore. What God is saying here is that this is my answer. This book that I have given you uh, the, to get, most importantly give you freedom from the tyranny of lies. This is why we do everything that we do. You believed at some point some lie that someone told you or maybe you told yourself and then you act on it. Somebody said, or let's say for example you believe a lie that I'm worthless. So then you act like a worthless person. You believe it to be true and you act on it. And God says, no, you're not worthless, you're valuable. And that's where he says that in the word. And that is to set you free from that lie, that oppression. I mean, go back through history. All oppression, all uh, uh, that the humans have ever done upon each other are based on one thing. Lies. <coughs> lies. You deserve it. Uh, you, you don't deserve deliverance. You deserve to serve me. Do what I want you to do. Satan does that to us. That's how he keeps us under control. He lies to us. But God wants to set you free. And his word is able to set you free. It is what is deliverance. How do I know this? Because the, the few times in my life where I've seen people get set free, it's only because of one thing. Now, I would love to take credit for it. Like, wow, maybe my great teaching, or you know, I just said the right thing, and they, they just got free. No, I don't listen. No, it doesn't do anything. What does something is this. God's Word. God's Word is the only thing that can set people free. His truth applied to the lies in your life. I remember very early on, uh, struggling uh, with a lot of bitterness, and I remember my mother sitting me down, talking to me, and said, you wouldn't believe these lies of bitterness in your heart. You've allowed them to take root, and now you're acting on them. I remember at that time, I had this terrible, angry problem. One little tiny thing would come out, and boom, rage at people. And, God, and she said, God can deliver you from this. And it's based on a root lie that you believe about yourself, and about someone else, and about God. And the Bible can set you free. And she had to look at a specific verse that dealt with that lie. And I meditated on that verse, thought about it, and it became a part of it, and eventually I believed it, and it began to change my life. And I don't have that anger problem anymore. I still get angry, you can ask my kids. It still happens once in a while. But it's not as severe as it was. God's truth gave me deliverance. Do you believe that God's truth can deliver you? Do you believe that God's truth can set you free? See, we, we're, we're, we want to look everywhere we can outside of the Bible. And sometimes religion gives us some tools to say, oh, hey, just try this. This will work. It doesn't. None of those things work. Only God's Word can set us free from the greatest oppression, the greatest oppressor who ever lived. That's Satan and his lies. Let's bow for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to think about this. Now, maybe you're telling yourself, well, God can't forgive me. He doesn't, he doesn't love me. I've done too much bad things. Maybe you're on the other side of the point. You think, wow, you know, based on the record of wrong that I've done, God can't deliver me because I just can't stay in the faith. I mean, every time I, every time I want to do what's right, I end up doing what's wrong. And I know what's wrong, and I don't want to do it, but I don't know how to be set free. God can set you free. See, it takes a choice. That's all it is for us. <laughs> we wish it was something else. 
We wish, man, if I could follow just X, Y, Z, I'd be free. But it doesn't work one, two, three, and I'd be free. No, it doesn't work that way. It just takes us to say, no, I'm going to believe the truth of God's word above everything else. I'm going to believe the truth that God is telling me about myself. I'm going to believe the truth that's in this passage, that God cares for me and that he is willing to hear and answer my prayers. you believe that truth? Or you telling yourself, no, that's not true. I'm going to live off my own experience. I've called out to God. He didn't answer. And so I'm just going to believe that lie and I'm just comfortable with it. Well, you know, you'll, you'll see the product come in your life. You'll, you'll start living the, the lies that you are telling yourself. But God doesn't want you to be there. God wants to give you freedom this morning. And if you're willing to repent and say, God, I can't do this on my own, give me freedom. Help me believe the truth of your word. God will deliver you. Period. Dear Lord Jesus, this is hard for me. I don't readily admit that. It's hard for me to, to say your word is pure. Your word is tried. Your word is enduring. And your word is the truth. Lord, I want to find truth someplace else. And I want to find deliverance someplace else. But deliverance only comes from you and the way you revealed yourself. And Lord, when I truly believe those words, it can truly set me free from the law of sin and death and deliver me from an eternal hell. Lord, I pray this morning that both believers and unbelievers, there's someone here this morning, that the truth of God's word is spoken to them, that, that, uh, that you are here. I pray, Lord, that they would this morning pray for deliverance, <laughs> pray for the faith to believe the truth of your word and be changed by that prayer. Pray these things in your name.